CAA have asked for input to gain user feedback on the existing and planned rules governing drone use in the UK. Now, there are some good ideas in here, but there are also some genuinely frightening proposals, including changes to the sub 250 gram model exemptions, and also the introduction of remote ID and taking it to new and frankly, I think even sinister levels. And all of these are lost in a staggeringly terrible, dense and incoherent document that was actually supposed to explain the background to the 19 questions they're asking. But in my opinion, seems specifically written to confuse us and worse, shape the answers you give to actually support their agenda. We have got just a couple more weeks to respond to this. So here is a quick outline on why you have to take this survey and I think stand up to what they're proposing. The problem isn't with regulation, but with the CAA's inability to provide succinct, coherent guidance in plain English. And this 28 page document is a prime example of the challenges that UK UAS pilots face today. That's not my quote, but it's actually a quote from the very type of person the CAA are asking for input from, a user of the Grey Arrows Drone Club Forum. And frankly, I could not have put it better myself. The CAA are asking us, you, anyone, who's got an interest in flying drones on how to shape the future of flying in the UK. And it is a chance for real improvement, but as we saw with the last consultation on legacy transition periods, what they give with one hand, they can very easily and quickly take away with the other. And buried in this document are some proposals that could really improve things, but others that I think are just plain bad. And the biggest issue is that in order to answer the questions and give the feedback, you need to read this guidance document, which as I said, is a truly awful document that rambles all over the place, contradicts itself, and mixes different subjects into combined single questions that makes it almost impossible to give a simple, straightforward answer. Now, I do not want to waste your time trying to explain every part of this utter mess of a document. Um, it's freely available for you to download and read through. No, my focus here is on the 19 questions they're asking for feedback on, made all the more difficult by the open-ended and non-specific nature of the questions themselves. First off though, I really do need to make this clear. Everything in this video, it's my opinion. It's my take on what this document means and how I have responded to it. I don't know the right answers to anything. All I can do is read it, think about it, think about the questions and respond in the best way that I think is right. And frankly, that's what you need to do too. But in saying that, the opening statement of the document does confirm one thing very clearly. After turning their back on the long awaited EASA C classification markings last year, we in the UK are now going to be stuck in limbo for at least another three years until at least uh, 2026 whilst they try and work out what to do. And whilst they talk a lot about simplification and making things more relevant, my genuine fear is that existing flying rights, especially for these smaller drones like the Mini 3 Pro, are going to be taken away and lumped in with much larger models that obviously have far greater restrictions. And the first few paragraphs outline the challenges that drone users currently have. And in truth, there are indeed challenges because 99% of users are flying models that have very little risk, namely the small sub one kilogram models. Whilst the regulations continue to classify and restrict models up to four kilograms or even 25 kilograms. So for question one, which asks, do you agree with the challenges with operational requirements identified by stakeholders and why? I had to neither agree or disagree because it's not exactly clear what the so-called evolving security and safety risks actually are because no evidence is shown. And the fact that remains that the majority of users and flights are consumers flying intelligent GPS lightweight drones under one kilogram. Therefore, they should simply benefit from the very simplest categories and rules in my opinion. And then we get straight on to question two. And here is why you can see why I'm being so critical of this entire exercise. Look at it. Question two, should the CAA adopt the following policy objectives for operational requirements and why? Mitigate safety and security risks, user centrics, enforceable, growth enabling and scalable. Please describe any other objectives that we should consider. What sort of question is that to ask the general public? Who in their right mind would write such a rambling, multi-subject open question and think they're gonna get a meaningful response to it all? It is mad. Fuck Tardarino springs to mind, but look, let's have a look at what they're actually after. The explanatory text talks about the hope to mitigate safety and security risks to protect flyers, operators, 
aviation and the general public from harm caused by misuse of UAS. This is my first real beef. What harm has there been? What evidence is there on such harm? Is this based on actual evidence or is it just based on fear mongering? So here I answered a no, because I don't actually see a genuine real current security or safety threat. None has been proved. Second point, should these objectives be user-centric, i.e. should they be easy to identify and understand? Why is this question even being asked? Who the f would actively want to create regulation that was difficult to understand? So why are we even asking such a stupid basic question? And enforceable, allowing regulation bodies to take action. This is a good one, and I'm gonna come back to that, uh, really. But for now, surely by definition, rules should be able to be enforced. And yet you're being asked this basic question along with being asked whether or not the objective should be uh, allowing growth for the sector and adaptable for the scale of the growth of the sector in the future. All of this asked in one long rambling question and I really think it's worded to make you answer to yes to everything when it is covering so many different things. How did I answer this? So look, I said overall existing rules and regulations could be sufficient, especially if more use of geofencing is made for sensitive areas, mitigation should only be on a proportional basis and based on actual evidence. Enforcement should again be proportional and only target those with a clear intention on disruption or misuse. It should not penalize users making simple errors. I did my best. Question three, which they just seem to throw in for fun. Do you value international alignment in operational requirements and why? Not much explanatory text on this one, so I answered a simple yes to an extent, because international alignment makes things easier for visitors, and crucially, it's gonna keep functionality uniform without having to have different restrictions based on different countries. We don't have to follow them exactly. We can have a slight divergence, and that may allow us more freedom to fly based on intelligent design and geo restrictions. Again, that's all I thought. Then we move on to the existing categories and whether or not they're too complex or complicated. Now, initially I thought, well, that sounds great. Who doesn't like simplification? But let's take a look at 2.10 in the explanatory notes where they state they're looking at replacing the open subcategories with a single set of requirements. And then they immediately say they're considering combining the A1 and the A3 subcategories into a single subcategory. So what is it? Are they replacing the subcategories or not? But more crucially, why are they considering combining A1 and A3? A1 is flying right over people. A2 is flying close to people, but this isn't even mentioned. And A3 is flying far away from people in open countryside. Now, I, I genuinely don't know if I'm just being thick here, but how can it make sense to combine A1 flying over people with A3 flying far away from people and presumably in, what, impose the same rules on what are fundamentally totally different risks? How are we supposed to make an informed decision and give feedback on such contradicting options devoid of any detail? It, it's absolute rubbish. So for question four, should the CAA rename the operational categories and subcategories? I answered yes, but only to make them more meaningful. The term open category is as simple as it gets, but having subcategories called A1, A2 and A3 means nothing to anyone. So yes, why not take a tip from Von Seal and call it what it is? over, near, or far away. Simple. But for question five, should the categories be simplified? No. What is there to be gained by combining rules for flying over people in congested areas with rules for flying far away from people in the open countryside? The subcategories identify the different types of flight with very different types of risk, and they need to stay separate. So that's what I put down. And then just for good measure, question six asks whether they should differentiate the rules for model aircraft. Now that was actually a simple one for me because I think, very unfairly, model aircraft flyers have seen so many of their flying rights eroded because of being treated like drones, which to me makes no sense. So for question six, I answered that yes, model aircraft, when flown or controlled directly from a flying club location, they should absolutely have separate regulations as they present very different technical abilities, far lower risk, and usually a higher flying skill of the operator. So absolutely split them off. So far, so good. Sorry if I'm ranting. I do feel strongly about this, as you can tell. But look, 
I feel strongly because of what I'm about to talk to you next. Uh, one of the real nasty questions that could really mess up how we fly with uh, these smaller sub 250 grand drones uh, like the uh, Mini 3 Pro. Sections 2.13 uh, to 2.14, they talk about the freedoms and exemptions of sub 250 grand models causing confusion and also specifically confusion on when a sub 250 grand model is actually a toy. And then 2.15 on here. They talk about whether or not these exemptions remain appropriate because of the risks they pose. They mention the risks of entering restricted airspace or unlawfully collecting personal and sensitive data. What does this specifically mean? Is this a direct response to the so-called auditors that are using drones to constantly buzz police stations? If these drones are being used to fly near places they don't want them to fly, then use geofencing and make the case for not flying near police stations, exactly the same as in place for prisons. Removing the freedoms that these little drones enjoy just because a few decades are pissing off the police is not the answer. So for question seven, should the CAA simplify exclusions from operational requirements and why? My answer was a very emphatic no. These small drones pose near negligible threat to safety and their use is widespread. Reliance on geo restrictions should be increased to avoid sensitive areas. Any model with a camera is clearly not a toy and should have GPS awareness. That's all that's needed here. We should not allow the CAA to remove this single best thing about owning these tiny small drones and remove the freedoms they've got. So do not underestimate the importance of question seven. Let me go on to the next section. Oh, I'm running out of breath here already. Transitional arrangements for existing models. Now, we have heard this before. The existing models that do not have the new EASA numeric C classifications. But here they're actually expanding things to include all new models, current models that are being produced up to the new deadline of 2026. So to be clear, they're talking about new models like the Air 3 that has only just been released and has got its nice new C1 marking on it that the CAA have chosen to ignore. And they're basically saying, if it's built and sold before 2026, then it won't have the new design features that we are going to design, so it's therefore gonna be transition. And what should we do about it? Then they go on to mention the sub 250 gram category again, being able to be flown in A1, i.e. over people, and A3, far away from people. But they don't make any mention of A2, near people. Uh, why, where's that gone? But then they immediately contradict themselves with the next statement saying that UAS less than 25 kilograms can only be flown in A3. Basic maths here, 250 grams is less than 25 kilograms. So what is it? If they're trying to say more than 250 grams but less than 25 kilograms, then say so. It's this sort of vagueness that is making things so difficult for us. Either way though, how long are we to stay in this purgatory of transition? We had it for two years. Then last year, they made all new drones still transitional. And now they're saying that we've got this for another three years. And still, I don't get why they are lumping a 500 gram drone with a 25 kilogram drone. So for question eight, should the CAA change transitional arrangements for users of UAS without class marks? I answered yes to an extent because there is no evidence to suggest that a drone bought today will suddenly become dangerous after 2026. It was the CAA that abandoned C classifications before they had an alternative, which is already unfair to everybody in the UK. There are new models sporting the new C1 label. So the transition arrangements should be changed to permit C1 label drones to have the same freedoms that they're enjoying in Europe. And if new designs do come out in the future with new class markings that permit new exemptions or freedoms, whatever, then those new permissions can apply to those new models. So again, a massively messy, but really important question to answer here. And so on to the next section, authorizations and risk assessments. Section 2.20 uh, to 2.24, they're relevant to 99% of users. These talk about the processes for complex flight authorizations, only focusing on professional users flying complex and far riskier flights. Uh, 2.25 to 2.27, they're also relevant to many amateur users. They talk about uh, the A2 CFC and the GVC, the uh, General uh, VLOS certificate. But staggeringly, they then talk about bringing in two more levels of certification called remote pilot competency, basic, and also advanced. Really, just how many levels of competency are required to fly a drone? 
I think they understand though this is going to be a fairly narrow market here because they simply state we welcome feedback on these proposals in a line that isn't a question, I think. It certainly doesn't appear on their uh, online uh, form. So I think most of us can probably jump straight on to chapter three, product requirements, where they make some claims that I think are simply plain wrong. Section 3.1 claims that today, most safety and security risks are controlled by actions of the pilot, but in future, the control should be by the drone itself. Sorry, disagree. Most GPS models already have got geofencing controlling sensitive areas. The biggest uncontrolled risk is simply flying too close or fast to people. Just like the biggest risk of cars is driving too fast or close to other cars. How can any design stop this? Geofencing already exists and it could be improved to be an effective block for flying in sensitive areas. Again, for the majority of users, what more can be done to the design of a drone itself to make it safer? Are we just complicating things for everyone just to satisfy the requirements of a very small minority of models or types of complex flights? They then go on to talk about existing regulations, including the class markings, yeah? The ones that they turned around and stuck two fingers up to last year. And then, however, the next few years, they plan to work with manufacturers and other stakeholders to adopt new requirements. Again, Lots of words there, but very little actual meaning or hard facts here. They then ask you in question nine, do you agree with the challenges identified by stakeholders? They're not telling you who these stakeholders are or what the actual challenges are. So for question nine, I had to answer emphatic no, I disagree. You don't advise who the stakeholders are, but fundamentally the class markings are quite simple. CO, C1, models make up the vast majority of models flown by amateurs and even professionals. These models already have specific technical requirements that have safety to their very core and they're accepted throughout Europe and cause very little confusion. So what is trying to be fixed here? To me, answering yes to this last question would only build their case for what they propose in the next few questions, which is what I am really, really worried about. So very quickly moving on. Next section talks about policy objectives. Again, didn't we do this in section 2.5? Again, they talk about the opportunities to mitigate safety and security, making things user-centric, growth enabling, and scalable and internationally aligned. Again, lots being squashed into one question here. Again, no evidence of actual safety or security threat. So this was a no from me. People intent on doing bad will always find ways to misuse equipment. Misuse of UAS can be summarized by flying a larger model too close to people, Smaller models present practically no risk here. And for criminals and so-called auditors, then make more use of geo restrictions to help mitigate this. But next, this is one of the big ones. And I know this is a long, hard video, but you really do need to see this next section, I think. It's section 3.8 and 3.9. They talk about class markings and the proposal to combine C1, C2, and C3. And then they talk about combining with labels for product weight to ensure no burden from divergence from the EU approach. Well, you mean that simple approach that clearly separates lightweight drones from heavier drones? How can it make sense to combine the C1 class covering drones up to 900 grams with C2 and C3 classes covering drones up to, what is it, four kilograms and 25 kilograms? Why do they keep on trying to lump in tiny lightweight drones with 25 kilogram monsters. So no, makes no sense whatsoever. And it's only gonna restrict the majority of users who fly sub, kilogram, sub one kilogram drones. So for question 11, again, thanks to its wording, we're a bit stuffed. Should the CAA implement manufacturer standards? Well, yes, of course they should, but not in the way they're proposing. Just re-implement the EASA-based C0 to C4 classes, as these are understood and clear and specifically focus on clarifying the C0 and C1 rules because these make up most models flown today. And question 12, should they implement a labeling scheme? Again, we have one, but the CAA are ignoring it. So yes, they should, based on the existing EASA-based numeric C0 to C4 labels. Really simple here. And then, Yet again, we're back onto the sub 250 gram exemptions. Sections uh, 3.12 to 3.14, they talk, I don't know, this section seems entirely focused on what auditors are doing and talking about infringing airspace and collective personal sensitive data. We covered this before in question seven, but here we are again. And they talk of the possible requirements for GPS awareness, which of course makes sense if you want to enforce 
geo-fencing. But here, for the first time, there's also this little mention of remote ID. But they still finish with the same format question as earlier. Should the CAA simplify exemptions from product requirements? So for question 13, I had to answer no, the current exclusions for flying C0 models are fine. But here we have the big one now. Uh, the next section is literally to me, when I read it, it's like a scene from George Orwell's 1984 with Big Brother always watching you. Because yes, they are finally talking about remote ID. They have got six sections on this, sections uh, 3.15 through to 3.20, outlining their concern and justification for what will be, I think, the most massively invasive point this entire document is proposing. 3.18 mentions capturing the takeoff point, the height, the route, and the speed, with data capture possible both locally and via a networked database. And crucially, it keeps historic data too. 3.15 states this information can be used for re-education, fines and convictions. This is a huge amount of data and they want it held historically for re-education or conviction at some time in the future. What are we? Are we in some communist country here? This opens the door for complete data harvesting by the CAA to actively chase down anyone they think that made an inappropriate flight, despite them not even being present in the first place or being in receipt of all the facts of the flight itself. The way I see it, the responsibility for a flight always lies with the pilot every time. The pilot makes the decisions based on the situation that he or she is finding them flying in. Just like driving, the responsibility for cars lies with the driver. That's it. So how can it be right for someone else to view data and make a call that the flight may have been beyond the rules at some point? They will not have all the facts of the flight or the situation to hand. Remote ID will literally allow anyone to monitor every aspect of the flight and allow the CAA or any organization that it licenses to trawl through the data and to try and find anyone they deem to have made an inappropriate flight. Imagine your car being tracked for every movement, every parking space you take up, every proximity to another vehicle being stored and trawled through for a possible final conviction at any time in the future. It's nothing to do with flight safety and everything to do with the persecution of people who, in the main, are probably just making innocent mistakes that breach complex and confusing rules. And this is the thing, isn't it? So many of the rules governing flights are so vague or open to interpretation, I think this can only lead to unfair penalising of users making innocent flights. Whilst the very small numbers of people that this technology is actually aimed at are simply going to bypass it anyway and carry on doing whatever criminal activity they want to do. So, for question 14, should the CAA implement remote ID? I said no. Remote ID does not assist with flight safety in any way and is, in the CAA's own words, simply a tool for re-education, fines or conviction. CAA really need to stick to flight safety and not persecution or data harvesting. That's not their role. You can tell, I feel a bit strong about that one. Finally, Next section moves on to something that already exists and could work quite well if it was administered properly. That is geo-awareness, otherwise known as geofencing. It's simply about managing a map of restricted areas for flying and stopping drones from flying there. It's already in place. Most DJI drones already have it and it could be implemented on other brands too. Now that some people do get annoyed by it, but to me it is easily the Easiest, simplest, and least intrusive way of stopping drones from flying in the wrong place. So for question 15, should the CAA implement geo-awareness? I said yes. It's the key to preventing unauthorized flights by unsuspecting users. In my opinion, all models with cameras, including the sub 250 gram models, should have geo-awareness required. Also, height-based geo-restrictions. I think they're massively underused, but could really, really help. A drone flown under 30 meters high is no threat to any other aircraft. So height restrictions should be used far more widely to allow us to fly lower level drone flights in more areas. But look, to be honest, after this point, the document and questions are thankfully a bit more lightweight. Uh, question 16, uh, should there be requirements for user guidance? Uh, yes, uh, you can't drive a car without learning basic user guidance and uh, drones I think are no different. So. I think DJ, most DJI drones already have uh, a bit of documentation or user guidance during the initial setup process. So it's already working. Yes, by all means, bring it in. 
Question 17 though, that was an interesting one. Should they introduce user validation as part of the setup process? So here what they're talking about is cross-referencing against the database of flyer IDs and operator IDs. And here, my answer was no, because whilst it actually sounds good in practice, you are then mixing technologies and data from completely different bodies. You have to be able to register more than one drone against the same ID. And so immediately I think you're gonna end up with just generic IDs posted online and the verification will literally be meaningless. Um, to me, I don't know if some of you might remember, it's a bit like having to give you a name and address to the shop when you bought a TV. Uh, that was a pointless exercise dropped decades ago because there was no actual value to the data. And I don't see any value with trying to cross-reference here. And then the last few sections on simplifying the policy and guidance document structure. I had to laugh, didn't it? I mean, this very document here is the perfect example of how impossible the CAA seemed to find it to produce simplified and streamlined guidance. Nothing the CAA touches seems to be simple or straightforward. So for question 18, I answered yes. I would be very happy to see anything that simplifies and clarifies the rules for flying drones. I look at the rules for paragliding, there are practically none. They can fly well above 400 feet and they have none of the regulations that drones have. And I genuinely wonder why, given the near total lack of any real incident involving a drone, why does the CAA keep running it round and tying itself in knots about the threats of drones that simply hasn't materialized? And so to the very last question, what other opportunities to improve regulations beyond those described here would you like to see progress? This is our chance to say what we want. When you look at the rules governing bikes, cars, paragliders, or DSLR cameras with telephoto lenses for capturing images and data, you wonder why are there so many regulations for drones? Considering 99% of users are simply flying small sub one kilogram models with GPS awareness and an app controlling everything, you are just left wondering why anything more than simple geofencing and height restrictions are all that's needed to regulate these things. So for me, my answer here was simply this. One, make the rules for smaller drones under one kilogram simpler. Two, clarify VLOS and make it more relevant based on seeing the area you're flying in, not just being able to see which way the drone is pointing as their recent guidance updated to us. If there's any danger from an approaching aircraft, down is the only way you need to go. So the current VLOS requirements are useless and crucially they risk being ignored by the masses. So make them relevant. Bring in lower height restrictions to let smaller drones fly in more places. Use geo restrictions to fly in more places and stop them flying in more sensitive places. And above all, make policy based on evidence, not paranoia. It's got to be evidence-based, and that doesn't seem to be the case for the moment. And that, my poor, poor people, is it. Um, what a total nightmare. And you can see from comments left on other videos and forums how universally despised this whole document and questionnaire is by practically everyone. But please do not be put off. Hopefully, I have explained some of the key points and I will post my answers below, not for you to copy as that would be pointless, but for you to read and see how I interpreted what they're talking about so you can make your own considered answers. But please do it. This really is your chance to put across your feelings to the CAA and try and stop some of the really bad things that are being proposed. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. Uh, thumbs up, help the video along. Thumbs down just tells YouTube you hate me and my videos, which I don't know. If you do, then yes, put a thumbs down. Either way, uh, please forward the link for this video to anybody that owns a drone. It really is so important. Click the links below and do this questionnaire and do it in the next week because certainly you've got to do it before the 7th of September as that's when it all closes. And then once you've done it, get outside, get out there, have some fun and happy flying.